This is the first video supplement for CIS 343, Grand Valley State University's Programming Languages course. This video discusses my rationale for using the Kava implementation of Scheme as our introduction to functional programming. The video then goes on to show how you can get Kava set up on both our EOS Linux environment and on your own machine. So let's begin with the rationale. Why are we covering Scheme in this course rather than Lisp or some other functional language? After all, our textbook argues that Lisp is the most important functional language because it was one of the first commonly used high-level languages developed. It was introduced in 1958, just one year after Fortran. And so not only was it one of the first high-level languages, but it was the first functional language to become popular. Interestingly enough, not only was it the first functional programming language, but some argue that it's the only functional programming language to date that has really ever gained widespread use. However, in spite of all this important history, and in spite of all the Lisp code that's already out there and still in use, modern Lisp implementations tend to contain so many imperative features, like loops and variables, that students resist programming in a functional style. Instead, they tend to cheat and use Lisp's imperative features rather than focusing on what makes functional programming unique and powerful. As a result, in my experience, at the end of a section on Lisp, I have a bunch of students that, instead of learning functional programming, have just learned how to take C and add a bunch of parentheses. So to avoid that problem, I'm going to teach Scheme. It's a dialect of Lisp. It looks a lot like Lisp except the main difference is that it has relatively few imperative features. For example, you can't write a traditional for loop in Scheme. You have to use recursion. So hopefully this means you'll get a very good feel for what it's like to program in Lisp, so you'll get that important historical context, but you'll have much less temptation to fall back onto comfortable imperative programming habits, and you'll get that small kick you need to really dig into what it means to program in a functional style. Having said that, realize that Scheme does have some imperative features. For example, you can create, set, and even reset variables. Take care to avoid these features. If you do use prohibited imperative features, then I'll ask you to redo the assignment. And of course, if you're not sure if a feature qualifies as one of the prohibited imperative features, just ask. Now, there are several versions of Scheme. So why are we using Kava in particular? Well, the main reason is that, in my opinion, it's the easiest to get installed. So Kava is a Java implementation of Scheme. So in the simplest case, installing Kava is as simple as saving a JAR file onto your machine. I'm going to show you a slightly more complex install process, like two extra steps, that gives you some better editing capabilities as you're using Kava. But you're certainly welcome to install and use it however you prefer. I'll also mention that because Kava is a Java implementation, it runs on the JVM, so from within Kava, you can call Java methods. I don't think that's going to be real relevant to what we're doing here in the class, but it is kind of a neat feature to keep in mind if you ever happen to get in a situation where you find that useful. I can only think of one disadvantage to using Kava, and that is some of Kava's standard built-in functions are different from Racket or other more popular scheme dialects. This is especially true of some of the functions you'll call to print text on the screen. So this doesn't really change the overall feel of how Kava works, but it does mean you need to be careful when you're looking up sample code on the internet. Okay, now we can finally get to actually installing and using Kava. I've already put Kava in my public space on EOS. So if you're going to do your scheme work in EOS or Arch, you need only run this command, tilde kermacy public cis343 kava-3.1.1 slash bin slash kava. What you're doing here is you're running a script named Kava out of a specific directory underneath my public directory. So when you launch this, you get an interactive shell and you can start typing Kava commands like I can add three and four and get seven. And of course, the first thing you should learn about any interactive environment is how to get out of it when you're done and you just type exit in parens. So this could be the end of what you need to know although that's kind of a mouthful to type, there's a better way to do that, and that would be to set up an alias. So what you can do is open your bash RC in Emacs or Vim or whatever your favorite editor is. And I got a lot of stuff in here. 
but you can go down to the bottom and add an alias. So I'm going to say alias Kava, and then I'll put in that, that whole mouthful. And save it. Now, .bash RC may not be the right place for the alias for you. I know sometimes these file names change over time as different versions of Linux get used here, but you should be able to refer back to your notes from CIS 241 to find the correct file name for your account. And now for that alias to take effect, I have to run the bash RC file again. So I'll type source bash RC. And now if I can just type Kava, and again, I'm in that interactive environment. So again, if you like working in the EOS environment, notice here I'm logged in through the web browser itself. You're good to go. If you prefer to work on your own machine or just want your own copy of Kava in your own space, then it's as simple as downloading it from their FTP site. Now, I find the easiest way to get the necessary files is to use a program called curl. Curl is just a command line program that makes web requests. Now, at first, that may seem like an absurd thing to do, make a web request on the command line. But in this case, we're not looking at a web page. We're just grabbing content off the web for offline use. So it's much easier to just type what we want here on the command line than to navigate through the web page. So in this case, I'm going to make an FTP request. Notice I had to specify what I want that output file to be called. Otherwise, it's going to dump that zip file onto the terminal, and then you just see a bunch of gibberish. And you can see I have that file. So now at this point, you just need to unzip the file, uncompress it. And it will create a directory named Kava-3.1.1. And that directory has some files in it, some documentation in it, and so on. And this is really what I did in my public space. If we look again, you'll see that there's a directory in there named Kava-3.1.1. So the equivalent in your own space is just to point into that directory. I could say here, notice I'm not going into my public space. I'm just going into Kava 311 bin, running Kava, and the program launches. So you can move that folder wherever you want. Uh, you can put it in your 343 directory. You can put it in your uh, software directory or whatever. Set up an alias and you're good to go. So if you don't have curl installed or and don't want to install it for some reason, you can go to the Kava web page at GNU.org. And there is the web page. You may want to link to this web page so you have it for reference. It also describes some of the built-in functions and so on. But for right now, the important part is getting it. So if you click on getting and installing Kava, and then the getting Kava link here, here is that FTP link I used earlier to the zip file. So you can, you can click on the link that way and you let your browser download it. And the same thing we did before. Move that zip file wherever you want to keep it permanently, uncompress it, and then set up your alias or your path or however you're going to do that on your machine. I did mention earlier that installing Kava can be as simple as copying a single jar file, but that using the full install had a couple of advantages. I just wanted to clarify that quickly. What we're doing here is the full install. Notice that when you're running Kava, you're running a bash script named Kava, and it's setting up some stuff. I haven't really dug into this, but it looks like it's setting up some JVM flags and some class paths and stuff like that. And that is really the better way to go. But at the heart of all of this is a single jar file. If you look in the lib directory, you see there kava.jar. So I could do, do this. And I do get an interactive command line, but notice there's no color highlights there. And more importantly, watch what happens. So I'm going to put in just some simple command, 5 plus 9. And if I want to go back and execute that command again, I can't. I get noise on the screen. So if you're trying out some commands and you want to rerun a command, you have to completely retype it. And I don't know why it's not letting me exit. I think the stuff, the invalid characters I put in there have messed it up. Hmm. So I just hit Control D 
and then did exit. So if you run into that, try the control D. But anyway, if I run Kava through that more complicated bash script, notice I've got that color highlight there. But I can also use my arrow keys to edit previous commands. So if you're wondering why I've got this whole zip file and the alias and all of that, as opposed to just a java-jar, this is why. All right, now that you have the interactive interpreter running, you can enter and execute lines of scheme code in sequence. As an aside, this is also sometimes called a REPL, a read, evaluate, print loop. You may have used a similar REPL in Python, Ruby, or some other interpreted language. Actually, now that I think about it, a shell script is a REPL. Every time you type in a command, it reads the command, executes the command, prints the results, and waits for you to type in the next command. But of course, most of your time spent with a programming language is not in a REPL because you want to write code that you can execute many times. So of course, what you do is you compose a text document containing source code. Scheme is no different. You can prepare a scheme file using any text editor you like, and then tell Kava to execute the code in the file, just like you do with Python or shell scripts or many other languages for that matter. You're welcome to use any text editor or IDE you like. If you already have a favorite, there's really no need to change on my account. But for demonstration purposes, I'm going to use Visual Studio Code. There isn't necessarily anything special about VS Code, but over the last five years, I found that it works very well across a variety of languages, and it doesn't slow my laptop to a crawl and drain its battery like some of the IDEs I was using before that. To use VS Code to work on a scheme assignment, first, you need to create a directory for the assignment. So here, I'm just going to create an empty directory. But for many of our assignments that have starter code, instead of explicitly creating a directory like I just did, you'll be cloning a Git repo. In either case, once you have a directory, CD into it, and then launch VS Code from the command line by typing code. You can probably launch code through the GUI in EOS, but since that's not how I tend to do it, I don't remember where that menu item is. So now I'm going to open the folder I just created for my pretend assignment. and then create a new file. Comments in Scheme begin with a semicolon. I'll save it with the SCM extension. And now I can type some Scheme code. Of course, we'll make this the canonical hello world. So display is the Scheme print statement. Now notice as I do this, I don't have any syntax highlighting at all. This is just a text editor at this point. But VS Code is smart. If we look down here at the bottom, if you haven't noticed this already, it says, hey, wait, you're doing something I don't recognize. Would you like an extension to handle whatever SCM is? So I'll click on Search Marketplace, and I'll look for a plugin that supports Scheme. I've been using this one here, the VS Code-Scheme plugin by Alan Huang. If you find a better one, please let me know. But I'll install that. And now you can see we have nice syntax highlighting. When I'm working in interpreted languages in VS Code, I tend to just run the code from the command line rather than try to set up some integrated running and debugging and all of that. And when I am launching code while working in VS Code, I tend to use the integrated terminal. So it's right down here at the bottom of the screen. I have easy access to it as opposed to switching back and forth between applications. So I am in the directory for this pretend sample assignment. So all I have to do to run my code is just say Kava and then the name of the file. And that's very interesting. Nothing happens. I can see I have a bug up here, but that bug's not the problem. So this is interesting. I just now saved the file. You can tell because the dot that was up here changed to an X. Usually when a tab loses focus, VS Code saves the file automatically. I'm not sure why that didn't happen here. I must have somehow accidentally turned the autosave feature off. Now I'll run the code again, and this time I got an error because I spelled display wrong. So Scheme is a less common programming language, so the plugins aren't necessarily as full featured. They're not going to detect as many errors as like a Java or C plugin would. I'll run it again and it runs Hello World as expected. So the important thing is now you have a place where you can enter, edit, and execute your scheme code. 
Again, it may not be as full featured as some environments you're used to for Java, C, C++, JavaScript, some more popular languages, but it will suffice for the amount of functional code we'll be writing throughout the course here. And although unintentional, hopefully seeing a couple of those glitches that I ran across, putting in this example will help you should you run across those same glitches. So this video was a little longer than I like to make my videos, but hopefully it does give you everything you need to know to get started, to get your environment working, to enter code. And so the next video will focus more on the details of the language itself rather than the environment around it. As always, be sure to let me know if you run into any unexpected trouble.